where you wanted to emphasize Spider-Man's body movements, and we would use the red and blue whenever we had an emotional story where we wanted to, to emphasize Spider-Man's facial expressions. It's hard to come up with facial expressions with a featureless mask, but Ron Friends is good enough to do it. In typical Peter Parker fashion, Peter couldn't make up his mind whether he liked the black costume or the red and blue costume, so he's constantly switching back and forth. And one time I think we even had him go out with the top of one and the bottom of the other because he's a very confused guy, uh, especially during laundry day. Basically, it was up to the writer which costume he wanted him to wear. And, and usually it was no bigger decision story-wise other than Spider-Man took his red and blue suit and put it in the sink to soak because it was dirty and forgot to take it out and hang it to dry. So he would go in and it's soaked, he can't put it on, so ooh, there's that black one that uh, my friend made for me. And he would go get the black one and put it on. I mean, for a while there, he actually had two distinct looks and, and we used both of them to, to great effect. As a writer, I discovered that uh, Amazing Spider-Man is actually the adventures of Peter Parker who occasionally dons a costume. And I also realized that it didn't matter to me what that costume looked like because Peter Parker is Peter Parker. And in the course of writing my first story, I took pains to try to show the readers that this is still the same old guy. You know, this was taking Spider-Man into a new arena. Spider-Man had always been, you know, he, he made the costume, the original red and blue costume, he sewed it himself. And, you know, so this kind of took him into more of a science fiction-y realm. And what Tom and I discussed was that this all had to be through Peter Parker's point of view. The reader had to be discovering with Pete what this suit could do to make sure that the character of Peter Parker didn't shift at all in the course of this and didn't embrace this in a way that would be out of character, but that he would react to it like the reader would react to it. You know, on one hand, it's great and it's fun, and look at me, and then also have it turn on him and go sour. people ask me, is there anything in the first movie that Tom and I created, I take credit for, for Mary Jane's crappy home life. <laughs> that, was, that was us. I mean, uh, the, they established in the first movie that, that she has an unhappy home life, and we really didn't know much about Mary Jane. When, when Tom and I came on the book, she had been a, a popular character for years because she was an attractive woman and a party girl and a lot of fun, and she was used in that capacity. She had always been portrayed as a party girl, as someone who couldn't take anything seriously. But any time Peter was in trouble, she would be the shoulder he would lean on, and she would always show a lot of compassion for Peter. So there seemed to be a lot more to Mary Jane than met the eye. Tom and I kind of made it our mission to, f to pardon the term, flesh out Mary Jane a little bit, and to get into her personality and to get into her past and try to explain why she was this way, and yet still make her an admirable character. And what we had kind of come across was the idea, uh, which is a running theme in Spider-Man, of course, is the masks that people wear. The way we hide ourselves and our true selves from different people. We had a story where a supervillain bursts in on Peter Parker and Mary Jane. Ron Friends, editor Danny Finger, and I worked out the details of the story. Um, I went home to type up the plot. I got to the moment where Peter is supposed to come up with some ridiculous explanation on why a supervillain would burst into his apartment. And as I got to that plot, I realized that Mary Jane was not going to buy it. And I was surprised when I typed out, Peter, I'm, I don't believe that. I know your secret. I've always known it. And I looked at the typewriter and I said, wow, Mary Jane knows who Peter Parker is. And I was stunned. So I immediately called up Ron Friends, and I said, Ron, you know that story I'm supposed to be working on? It has a different ending. One night, I remember getting the phone call that, how do you feel about the fact that Mary Jane knows that Pete is Spider-Man? And I said, oh, when did she discover this? And he said, we don't know. As far as the reader goes, that's not what's important at first, but what we're going to do is we're going to have her announce, Peter, please stop with all the subterfuge. I know you're Spider-Man. And we can worry about when she actually discovered it later. And I said, wow, that's, that's 
that sounds neat. I mean, that'll be a great cliffhanger when she makes that announcement. So Ron and I started to talk about it, and the more we talked about it, the history of Mary Jane emerged for us. We settled on this idea that the party girl persona that Mary Jane had put forth all these years was her mask. It was what she put forward to, to keep a distance between herself and other people uh, so that she wouldn't be hurt. And we delved into her past. You know, her father was a failed writer who took it out on his wife and kids, so she was a, a product of divorce. And it was, a, it was a tough divorce, and the mom went from relative to relative with uh, Mary, Mary Jane and her sister. And we just heaped shovelfuls of pain on this poor girl that put her on an equal footing with a lot of the tragedy in Peter Parker's life. And, of course, Pete was embarrassed after knowing her all these years to find out that there was all of this depth and texture to her, and it just deepened their friendship. And for most of our run, they remained you know, old, good friends. When we went to tell the story, you know, people realized, wow, there is really a lot we didn't, we never knew about this character, even though she's been around for years. There was a lot we didn't know about her. People who didn't like Mary Jane before and, and people who never had much use for the character recognized that we had kind of given her some depth and some breadth that, that, that appealed to them, that, that made her more likable and made her more understandable, more relatable. She explained why Peter was always attracted to her, because the guy has great taste. People have often asked, what did the symbiote want from Spider-Man? Was it out to control him? Did it want to hurt him? I always thought that it was like a pet that had fallen in love with its master and got very angry when Peter decided he didn't want to be with it anymore. The costume itself, being a living organism with rudimentary feeling, it wanted to reconnect with Peter. With the launch of a new Spider-Man title in the early 80s called Web of Spider-Man, they decided that a cool way to launch the book would be to interact with the symbiote again because it was a popular concept. The costume was locked up in Reed Richards' laboratory, escaped there for a couple of months, and then stuck back into Spider-Man's apartment and then slipped over him and tried to take him over. The, the symbiote more aggressively bonded with him and took control of him, and he was not happy about this. Now, remembering that it was vulnerable to a sonic attack and not having any high-tech equipment available, Peter fled to a bell tower and was standing right under the bells when they went off. And, of course, you know, his ears started to bleed. It had a physical impact on him, but it also chased the symbiote away. Now, at that point, the symbiote wasn't contained. At that point, the symbiote was, Peter thought, was destroyed by the intense sound. Tom and I were really only responsible for that, that first arc, where he finds out it's alive and he gets rid of it the first time. Todd McFarlane came on the book after me and he kind of reset the bar. He used the black costume to create a new character. It bonded with another human being. 